and uh, today we're having uh, Jules, and he's going to talk about McDonald polynomials and long-range spin chains. Thank you for coming. Great, Sava, thank you very much for uh, having me and um, asking me to give a talk in your seminar series, which unfortunately is a little bit outside of my time zone, regular time zone, so I haven't been participating in person before. Uh, also, my research is really slightly outside the standard scope of the um, the series. I think this might be the only, well, maybe last week was the same. It, it, I unfortunately do not have uh, anything to say about lattice models at this point, although, uh, well, well, we'll get there later. But I do think that the, my work touches on many uh, topics that people in the audience are interested in, in particular, McDonald's polynomials. And uh, as you might know, spin chains are closely related to, for instance, the six vertex model. So here's kind of a different type of spin chains. And I'll get there. Um, so it's based on uh, joint work with Vincent Pasquier and Didi Nesterban from um, Saclay in Paris and ongoing work. So I've been kind of revisiting this problem to put it in a kind of a more mathematically clean language. If you have any questions, please uh, just interrupt and ask me. So the motivation is this spin chain called the Haldane Shastri spin chain. Um, so here's the Hamiltonian. Oops, sorry. Um, here is the Hamiltonian. So it is. Normally, you might know for the Heisenberg model, you have a spin chain Hamiltonian, which is just the sum over nearest neighbor sites that interact with this anti symmetrization, one minus the permutation. Where here I'm thinking about, let's say, um, a GLR spin chain, where each site has the, the standard representation, so the R dimensional representation of GLR. But now for the Haldane Shastri spin chain, instead, we have a sum over pairs of sites, like actually, like I depicted in the picture at the right top. And um, the interactions are damped by some sort of pair potential, which can be written in this form minus zi, the j over the square of the, dif the difference, where I will always use this funny notation that the zj's are the j powers of the primitive nth root of unity. So I think of these zj's as precisely the location of. This is ZJ if you think about the spin chain as sitting in the unit circle in the complex plane. So this is just some multiplicative variables. And if you want, if you prefer just normal uh, real coordinates, you, you, you explicitly plug this in the potential and you get this one over sine squared uh, potential that I have here. A very nice geometric meaning is that this is just one over the square of this coarse distance between the particles at sites I and sites J. So it's kind of a very nice geometric meaning. And for later use, let me note that this long range um, pair permutation can be written in this funny way where basically it's as, well, I write down the formula here, but it's as depicted in this picture. So now I think of the particle aside J as first being moved through nearest neighbors all the way to I plus one. And then it's anti is anti-symmetrized um, indicated by the zigzag line here with the particle at site I, and then it moves back to site J. Right, so this is just a slightly strange way of rewriting this more familiar term. Maybe I should note um, in the case that R is two, so we just have an SL2 spin chain with spin one half at every site. Then this anti-symmetrization, one minus the permutation, can be written as one minus the Pauli matrix dot Pauli matrix uh, over two interactions, which you may have may be more familiar for the Heisenberg spin chain if you've seen that before. Now, this operator is a very remarkable operator. So if we think about this as an operator on uh, the n-fold tensor product of CR, then it has a lot of symmetries. So firstly, it has what I call abelian symmetries. Namely, it belongs to a family of commuting operators. So there's this operator, there's a shift operator, and there are all sorts of higher Hamiltonians that all commute. Moreover, this family, and in particular this Hamiltonian, also have non-abelian symmetries. So they commute with the action of the Youngian. This is different from the Heisenberg spin chain where there is an action of the Youngian um, in the XXX case, um, but it doesn't commute with the Hamiltonian. Instead, you use it via sort of a highest weight like construction to produce the full spectrum with the beta ansatz. So in this case, we, don't, we can't do a beta ansatz because we have symmetries. The Youngian acts by symmetry. So all the ABCD operators, if you're used to that language, they all commute with this Hamiltonian. So this Hamiltonian have, has a lot of symmetries and therefore a very degenerate spectrum. Moreover, for R is two, so in the case of the spin one half GL2 model, then its highest weight factors for these Youngian actions can be written down very explicitly. 
And if this is the eigenvector psi lambda, it's completely determined by, well, if lambda is, is some partition with certain properties by this component. So if, so here I'm thinking of C2 as written in terms of spin up and spin down as usual. And then if I look at the special vector where all the spin downs are sitting on the left and all the spins up are sitting to the right, then this component of the eigenvector has this beautiful wave function. It's just, here's a product over i less than j up to m. Here, little m is the number of excitations. It's the number of down pointing spins in this picture here. So we just have a van der Monde squared for these zets. Remember, they, I think of them as the coordinates of the down spin. So this is zi1, zi2, zi3, zi4. So here we have um, just the van der Monde squared for all these zets for the down spins. And then there is this polynomial, this symmetric polynomial, which is a jack function, or more precisely, it is a spherical zonal uh, jack function. So the parameter of the jack polynomial is one half here. So the exact eigenvectors are determined by these very, very simple wave functions. This is really different from the Heisenberg spin chain, where you would have to do a beta ansatz and you have to solve beta equations to really get actual eigenvectors. Now, there's nothing like this. If you just put in the correct partitions, then these are, well, or here's the, the precise formula. If I call this function, thinking of this as a function of z, if I call it f lambda, then the, wave fun the, the whole vector is precisely built like this. So the, the vector which has the down spins now sitting at arbitrary sites, like in this picture, has component given by this function above, but now evaluated at those z's corresponding to those sites. So it's a very explicit uh, eigenvector. And um, this is exact as well. So uh, it's, it's like the beta vectors, but without any need for solving beta equations. Historically, the origin of this model is that it's actually a sort of a lattice toy model for the fractional quantum Hall effects. So in, in part, in the, in the fractional quantum Hall effect, certain wave functions are precisely of this van der Monde squared form. But moreover, this model, if you study the spectrum, you can show um, that it exhibits fractional uh, exclusion statistics. So the, the elementary excitations of this model are not bosons, they're not fermions, but they're really particles that kind of sit halfway. So Haldane called them semions. Their, their statistics is halfway between that of bosons and fermions. So if you exchange two, actually you do not get a plus sign, you do not get a minus sign, but you get a factor of i. And for Haldane, this was quite useful to, to understand these type of uh, fractional statistics. And of course, this for him was part of, of his research line that led to a Nobel Prize um, a few years ago. So this, mo this model is very physically uh, motivated, but it has all these beautiful mathematical properties. And I want to focus not on the physics, so this was the most physics-y slide of today, but rather I would like to talk about the mathematics because there's actually a very beautiful uh, story underlying uh, all of this, um, which explains where the abelian symmetries and these non-abelian symmetries come from. And you can deform this story to get sort of, well, I would normally say the Q deformed Haldane Shastri spin chain, but I have McDonald polynomials. And unfortunately, McDonald wrote T instead of Q. So I'm going to call it a T deformed Haldane Shastri spin chain, where T deformed just means uh, partially isotropic, which means that it doesn't commute with all of GLR, but only with its Cartan subalgebra. Or if you wish, it's just the XXZ like version um, of the Haldane Shastri spin chain. So here the Hamiltonian looks a bit different. It is again the sum over pairs. This potential is a little bit deformed because I put these little factors t here. So you see we have this we have this van der Monde squared like denominator, which is now kind of like a t van der Monde, but in a way that is still a symmetric function. And then I still have this picture where I move particle j all the way to i plus one. Then I interact and then I move it back to j. But now these permutations are to be interpreted as being done by the R check matrix of the quantum loop algebra. And I'll get back to this a uh, bit later. And this empty symmetrization is uh, a constant times the derivative of the R check matrix. So this actually, this interaction is just the same like for XXZ. Uh, it's independent of the parameters. But these permutations here, the, the R checks, they really depend on all these parameters that I put at the bottom of the lines, which are again these Zs, these root of unity variables. Now this operator might look a little bit weird and I'll really kind of derive the form during the talk. So no need to understand it at the moment, but just notice that it looks quite similar to the 
Aldenian free spin chain. And if you let t to one, then this becomes the permutation. This becomes one minus the permutation. And this, of course, goes to the same pair potential that I had. So this whole Hamiltonian becomes the Haldane tree Hamiltonian as t goes to one. But the really remarkable feature is that if you have this slightly more complicated version of the Hamiltonian, then again, it has abelian symmetries. So it belongs to a family of commuting operators, which all have non-abelian symmetries, which in this case are quantum affine, or since I have finite dimensional representation, more precisely quantum loop algebra representation. So I'll, again, this is normally Q, but unfortunately, McDonald's T1 half. So there's a UT1 half of the loop algebra of GLR. Or if you like Jimbo and Miwa notation better, it is the affine algebra, but without the de uh, derivation at level zero, which is the same as the quantized loop algebra. Um, now, again, for RS2, this has exact quantized loop algebra, highest weight eigenvectors determined by partitions just as before with simple component. So all the down spins sitting to the left, all the up spins sitting to the right, which in this case has this T deformed van der Monde square, but in such a way that it's a symmetric function. I've uh, written this slightly different than here, but actually this denominator, if I take into account the T from the numerator, is precisely the same as this factor here. So we have a T deformation of the van der Monde squared, and then we have a T deformation of this particular Jack polynomial, which is now a McDonald's polynomial, or more precisely, because there is a relation between the parameter Q and what is usually called T for McDonald's, which is uh, this special case is called the quantum spherical zonal polynomial. So somehow, if you accept to look at this slightly strange operator, then you preserve all the beautiful properties um, that this uh, operator has. And my goal here is to try to explain to you what the underlying mathematical structure is and where all these properties come from. So here I just repeat the Hamiltonian. And now the plan for this talk is, well, I would like to actually make a little detour through more representation theoretic matters and use a sure while duality, or more precisely, it's quantum affine version, and then something that we call freezing. So kind of the schematic picture. So here, back here, is the spin chain that we were looking at before. And the idea is that actually, really, you should start with the affine Hecke algebra. One thing you can do is you can look at the representation on symmetric polynomials. Physically, you think of this as a model of moving particles on a circle. And this is the McDonald or McDonald Reissenaars, if you want a more physical perspective, uh, model, which has these abelian symmetries. So it has many commuting operators, namely the McDonald's operators, and it has exact eigenfunctions, which are McDonald's polynomials. Now, rather than just looking at symmetric polynomials, you can also look at symmetric polynomials that have coefficients in this CR to the nth tensor power. So I think of this physically as particles that move around the circle that also carry a spin, where each spin is in CR. So this is a spin version of the McDonald's Reissenaars model. Again, it has abelian symmetries, as I will show. But also, unlike the scalar case, it has non-abelian symmetries. So this has an action of the quantum loop algebra that is really uh, properly understood as coming from this quantum affine sure while duality. And it has exact eigenvectors. And then you can take some very special limit, which we call freezing, to get a spin chain. So the particles are no longer moving physically. The idea is that the potential energy becomes much more important than the kinetic energy. So the particles kind of are moving slower and slower and slower, and they want to sit down at their equilibrium positions. And those are the equally spaced positions that I draw here that you are supposed to get for a spin chain. And then we get this T-deformed Haldane-Shell free spin chain with its abelian symmetries, its non-abelian symmetries, and for the case RS2, at least, these very nice uh, exact eigenvectors. So in the next number of slides, I'm actually first going to talk about this quantum affine sure while duality. And once we understand that, we really understand how a good way of looking at these two maps here. And then in the second part, I'll explain how this freezing works and get back to all these properties when I can formulate them a little bit more properly. All right. So last week, uh, I think you had a talk of Wei Ying, a um, colleague here in Melbourne. So he already talked to you about the affine Hecke algebra. But let me just repeat in case you haven't seen this um, and you're not so familiar with this. So I start with the Hecke algebra, or really the Iwahori Hecke algebra. 
um, in this talk, I will just focus on type A. And it's a unital associative algebra with generators T1 up to Tn minus 1, subject to the braid relations and some extra condition, the quadratic relation known as the Hecke condition. If I would take the parameter T to be 1, then this condition here just says that T squared is the identity. So this is nothing but really the group algebra of the symmetric group. So think of these T's as some deformed versions of permutations. Now, this Hecke algebra, just like normal permutations, has two important representations for the story here. One is that on polynomials. So you can either take Laurent polynomials, like here, or you can take polynomials. But in either case, it's in n variables. And these operators t are represented by these um, uh, operators here. So there's t to the 1 half minus some rational function. And then there's 1 minus the permutation si, where si is just the permutation of coordinates xi and xi plus 1. So these are called the demasuralistic operator. And one thing that's important to notice is that if you send t to 1, then it just becomes 1. This function goes to 1. So you get 1 minus 1 minus uh, permutation. So you just get the permutation. So that's good. It is a TD formation of a permutation. Another representation, which I want to call the spin representation, is on this n-fold tensor product of CR. So I take R to be an integer, let's say at least 2. And let me call this n-fold tensor product of CR W. Then these Hecke generators, the TIs, can be represented as acting non-trivially only on factor i, i plus 1, by a simple matrix, just like permutations, uh, the simple transpositions uh, would. But in this case, this matrix, well, so let me just write it down for R is 2. It has this form here, where, again, it's useful to first look at the limit actually t going to 1. Then this entry here vanishes, and all the others that are non-zero become 1. So I just get back the permutation matrix, as I should. So that's good. And now you see, so it's deformed a little bit in a kind of a little bit non-symmetric way. So these two entries are not the same anymore. And you can check that this, again, does obey all those relations. Now, if you're not so familiar with the Hecke uh, algebra, but you are more familiar with lattice models and therefore R matrices, it's useful to make this connection. So Jones notes that, that I can take a linear combination of the Hecke generator, this, this matrix T. So I'm at the moment, so here I just take n is 2, if you wish. Uh, no, the nodes have not yet been uploaded. Um, so if I take the Hecke generator, and here it's inverse. So it's just a linear combination of either the identity and the Hecke generator, or the Hecke generator and its inverse, with some rational coefficients. So let me call in, in the uh, variables u and v. Then this is nothing but this R check matrix of the ratio u over v. And pictorially, I want to look at this, to think of this as some sort of permutation. And this is precisely the R matrix of ut to the 1 half, the loop algebra, so the quantized loop algebra of GLR. Um, and just to be clear, this is the R check matrix. So if you would multiply by the permutation, then you get the usual R matrix. And um, conversely, if you take some, some multiple of this R check matrix and you send, so here I just have the R check matrix of one parameter u, and I send u to either 0 or infinity, then I get back, as you can see from this formula here, precisely the, this Hecke generator or its inverse. So this is sometimes called the braid limit. Um, and the important thing that Jones notes is that precisely the braid relations and this Hecke condition guarantee that the R matrix obeys the Young-Buxter equation and this, uh, what we sometimes call the unitarity condition. Um, and the analog, the analog of this property as uh, for t going to 1 is if you take the parameter u to be t to the x, so you rescale a little bit, then it becomes precisely the permutation because I have the R check times this uh, R matrix, which is just the one that you know for the XXX spin chain, or it's called the Young R matrix. It's related to the five vertex model, although this one is symmetric. Uh, but it's a rational limit, at least. Now, what is very important for the story, and the, the thing that I really want to focus on, is that this, well, actually, both of these representations are re uh, reducible. But in particular, the one on this spin space decomposes as some direct sum where each of the summands are labeled by partitions of n, the number of 
uh, let me call them sides. And the, these partitions can have a length at most r because my vector space is r-dimensional, so I can't kind of anti-symmetrize more than r times. And it summons contain these what are what I call uh, quantum spect modules. So they're T deformation of the usual spect modules for the symmetric group, um, which are precisely all the finite dimensional irreducibles. So if you would vary all these partitions here and you would allow for arbitrary length, then you get all the finite dimensional Hecke algebra irreducible representations on the left in here. And then these things can occur more than once. So there's some kind of multiplicity space, which I call V subscript lambda. Um, and this just means that this big tensor product contains the dimension of this space, many copies of this quantum spec module. So this is one way. So this, this is this reducibility of this representation. It decomposes. And each of these right, is a Hecke algebra module. And let's say the Hecke algebra, so it acts trivially on there. It doesn't do anything there. So this is one way to really understand the action of the Hecke algebra on this big tensor product. Now, quant this is very closely related to quantum sure while duality. So at the top, I just uh, I will often repeat what I had before because uh, at least my memory is never perfect. So you can kind of read back stuff. So the important thing is that actually the Hecke algebra action on this tensor product commutes with a representation of not the loop algebra, but just the quantized algebra of GLR. So think U cube GLR, where now I view this C to the R as the standard representation. So just the deformation of the standard representation of GLR. And more precisely, these don't, two actions don't just commute, but they generate each other's commutant in the space of all linear operators on the space. So really, if you ask which operators act with the Hecke action here, the answer is precisely everything that you get from here and conversely. And moreover, actually, the second factor that I called the multiplicity space before has a beautiful interpretation. Namely, it is precisely the highest weight module for um, quantized GLR. And here are two pictures, because I think it's kind of nice to, um, to look at this. So if I would take n uh, sides, and I take RS2, so just GL2, it's been one half representation. So now I'm going to draw a dot for each basis vector. So I'm going to choose some particular basis vectors for the space that really show this structure here very nicely. So here I have the weights, if you like that, or here just more concretely the number of down spins. And here I've labeled the partitions in that direction. So here you see one. So for the partition, which is just phi, the one entry partition, I have one string of dots on top of each other. This one here has zero down spin. So I know explicitly it's up, 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 uh, well, five times. And then below it, I have some other things, and they're all symmetric. And you would get one from the other by applying the uh, GL2 or UQ GL2. Uh, so here, if you apply the lowering operator, you get this way. And if you apply the raising operator, you go this way. So um, I guess F goes this way and E goes this way, if you like that language. And there's one copy. So the interpretation is that this is precisely the spin well, five halves or the uh, six-dimensional representation of GL2 or the quantum GL2. And in this direction, nothing happens. So this is the trivial representation for the Hecke algebra. Now for this partition here, we get slightly shorter strings here. So it's the four-dimensional representation or spring uh, spin three halves. And in this direction, now the Hecke algebra acts non-trivially, and this is the standard representation. So I have in this case, four copies of the four-dimensional uh, quantum GL2 representation. And in this direction, I have four copies of the standard representation for the Hecke algebra. So if I start with a particular vector here, I use the lowering operator of quantum GL2, I go here. Or if I use suitable Hecke algebra elements, I go in this direction. So I can go from here to here, for instance, by following that path or any other path in there. Now, similarly here, I only have um, spin one half, so just the two-dimensional representation. But I actually have five copies, and they fit together in this case. The uh, Hecke algebra representation looks a little bit more. It doesn't look just like a line. And I have two copies of these kind of kites. And uh, I have five copies of these lines in that direction. And in principle, if you look at the partitions of five, you would expect these guys. But their length is too long, so I'm anti-symmetrizing too often. So they don't appear in this particular case. So here I have just one more example to show you what happens if my uh, rank R is high enough. 
So then let me take less sides. So just three sides, but uh, three dimensional vector space. Then I get again for the uh, partition three, I just get the, um, uh, well, the trivial representation for the Hecke algebra. So there's just one copy of this structure. And this is, um, well, whatever representation uh, it is uh, for GL3. Here we have for GL3, we have the joint representation, which looks a little bit like a wheel with a double point at the origin. And for in the Hecke algebra direction, there are actually two copies of them. So I have another one sitting here. And then finally, in this case, I can actually anti symmetrize or Q anti symmetrize three times. So I have the sign representation for the Hecke algebra or the Q deformed, T deformed sign representation. And it's a trivial representation for GL3. Okay, so very explicitly, that's what this decomposition looks like. You have spaces kind of in this direction or this direction, and then you have many copies of them in this direction. Now, there is a slightly more fancy point of view that is very useful to have. So I'm going to add a little bit. So there's an alternative perspective on sure wild duality, which is called the quantum sure functor in this case, which is a map that sends to finite dimensional Hecke algebra module, a finite dimensional quantum GLR module. So what you do is you take a module, and to be precise, you take a tensor product over the Hecke algebra um, with this space W that we studied before. And essentially what this does is if this one is one of these quantum specht modules, so one of these red lines in the picture here, then it's sent to, well, zero if I'm going to anti-symmetrize too often, and that's not good because in this W, we now have this dimension sitting, or else we get precisely this highest weight lambda representation of quantum GLR. So in that case, what it does is if you give me one of these red lines, then I select for you this blue component, let's say to the left of it. Okay, so it's kind of like a map which sends from one direction to the other direction. So it's a bit kind of pictorially, it kind of acts like that. And this point of view is the point of view that I want to keep. Okay, so I'm going to upgrade this to the affine level. So if there are any questions about this, probably now is a good time to ask. If not, I'm happy to continue. All right. So now I'm going to upgrade this Hecke algebra that we had before and call it to the affine Hecke algebra. To be precise, it's the affine Hecke algebra of type GLN, just like Wei Ying talked about last time. So the way I think about it is we have Hecke algebra, tensor product with polynomials in, or actually Laurent polynomials in generators Y1 up to Yn. And this Hecke algebra elements just have the usual relations that I discussed before. But now these Ys, there are maximal abelian subalgebra, so all the Ys commute with each other. Of course, the Y inverses are the inverses of the Ys. So they, this is really just a copy of Laurent polynomials. And then these two factors, they talk to each other via some sort of cross relations. So Ti, Yi, Ti plus, uh, sorry, Ti, Yi, Ti is Yi plus one. And if the, the label J of the Y is sort of far enough from I, then they just commute. And look, note that this is not quite conjugation by T, but I really multiply from both sides by T, and then I kind of transport the label by one. And if T goes to one, then this becomes something called the degenerate affine Hecke algebra that I don't want to introduce here, but if you know it, it's kind of good to know that it comes from this setting. And again, I'm going to look at two important representations. Um, they're a little bit different from before, but these are the two that are really going to be important. So one is what I call M subscript Z, where Z is just an M tuple of non-zero scalars. And in a bit fancy language, what I'm going to do is I'm going to induce up. So, okay, I'm going to start with a one-dimensional representation of these Laurent polynomials, where Z is just the eigenvalue of the Ys. So Yi acts on this vector Vz by Zi, by the scalar Zi. And then I'm going to induce this up to the affine Hecke algebra. In other words, I'm going to basically act freely by all these Ts, modulo the relations that I have here and these cross relations. So this has a basis. This, this module here has a basis indexed by all the permutations, because that's a basis for the Hecke algebra. So in particular, its dimension is n factorial. So here is the explicit form of this basis. And then, um, right, so the last thing that you would need to specify here is how do the y's act on it? And well, that's precisely what is governed by these relations here. Okay, so you just basically, it's like a Fock module, uh, modulo all the relations that you have here, and it's just finite dimensional in this case. 
because there are only so many different Hecke generators. And if my point Z was generic, then this module is actually irreducible. And by generic here, I mean that the, the Zs are not allowed to differ by a factor of T. Okay, so this is one representation. I will show later that this is actually something that you in some sense already knew. Now, another representation again is on polynomials. So the Ts, the Hecke generators act by the same operators as I had before, these the Mazur lustig operators. Now the Ys act by some combination of these de Mazur lustig operators and something that I call rho, which is just a cyclic uh, permutation that it also introduces some non com uh, some non zero complex number q. So the details are not so important. These are called difference operators, or more precisely, Cheretnik's difference operators. And if you take q, uh, t to the one in the right limit, then you get uh, you see that these are basically a deformation of Dunkel operators. Now, this polynomial representation is reducible. Um, it's not going to enter your wild uh, duality in, in just a way like before, but it's good to notice that its finite dimensional affine Hecke algebra irreducibles are precisely uh, characterized by partitions that are uh, length at most n. And then the eigenvectors in each of these irreducible components. So, sorry, these are the irreps, and this is the whole space, of course. So each irreducible component is labeled by a partition, and the basis of this irreducible component is precisely given by non-symmetric McDonald's polynomials, which are labeled by um, all the permutations of this partition. So you look at the orbit of the partition, all the compositions corresponding to it, and for each of them, there is an uh, eigenvector of the y's with some known eigenvalues, and the normalization is fixed by saying that they expand by just the monomial x to the power mu, and then all sorts of lower monomials in some ordering. And again, let me just mention, if you go sense t to one, then you get what would be called the non-symmetric Jack polynomial. All right, now I'm going to do the same uh, quantum affine, now the sure wild duality, but now the quantum affine point of view. So here I have something just like before, the sure functor. But in this case, I take a finite dimensional affine Hecke algebra module, and I spit out a finite dimensional quantized loop algebra module. And what we do is, as before, we take this tensor product over the Hecke algebra with this phase W, which was the nth tensor power of C to the R, like before. And moreover, it has an explicit action of the quantized loop algebra. And the idea is, if you know what the inhomogeneous uh, XXZ spin chain is or the inhomogeneous six vertex model, take your favorite representation of uh, the quantum group in that case. So technically, this is a tensor product of evaluation modules, where the parameters, the inhomogeneities, are the evaluation parameters. And now formally replace these evaluation parameters by those y's that are now operators. So from a sort of a physics -y perspective, this has been called quantized inhomogeneity. So we kind of promote the inhomogeneities from just being numbers to operators. So for example, if R is two, so I have my GL quantum GL2 action. So the quantum GL2 action, to be precise, it looks like this. So let's so it acts on the the affine Hecke algebra module just by the identity. And then there's a sum over, well, here I used either explicit matrices or the sigma, the Pauli matrices, if you prefer that. And it's just some tensor product of the diagonal. Uh, so for E, it is diagonal operator a number of times. And then it's this uh, upper triangular matrix here. For F, it's sort of the opposite. It starts with lower triangular, and then there's some diagonal matrices. And K is just represented by its diagonal, by a product of tensor product of uh, diagonal matrices. So details here are not important. The only thing that I want to show is that if you knew this Dreamfeld Jimbo presentation for affine quantum groups, and here you would have the evaluation parameters, and now they're replaced by those y's, which are understood as acting on the first factor of this tensor product. Or if you like L operators, then you take the usual expression for the L operator as a product of R matrices, but you really replace these inhomogeneities uh, by the y operators like here. And here are some technical details, how you really are supposed to understand uh, this expression as acting on this tensor product. Namely, write these R matrices. Oh, I should have written this down, sorry. R again is P R check. So I use this, I move all the P's to the front. Then here I have R checks. And these R checks, basically this is the same formula as the Baxterization formula, rewritten a little bit. But now I explicitly have one free factor, which is a rational function involving the y's and some extra parameter u. 
so this really acts on this module with formal power series in u let's say and then on the second act factor you act by just a hacker for uh, um, the hacker representation on the spins and here if you're really careful you notice that there is an r check zero one and this should be understood as really well we've introduced one extra factor of c2 because we do this l operator formalism so we have one extra kind of space with parameter u and so now i have this c2 tensor w which is really n plus one copies of c2 so this is actually a module for the hecke algebra n plus one and it has an extra generator t0 so that's where this r check zero comes from okay and these two relations are uh, the presentations are related anyway details are not so important let's do this the second point which is really important uh, here is that actually this thing here has a little bit more than before so it's not just a module of the quantized loop algebra but it moreover remembers a little bit of the action of the Hecke algebra namely the center of the affine Hecke algebra which is symmetric Laurent polynomials in the y's also still acts on this uh, quantized loop algebra module. And this center, of course, because it's in the center, it commutes with this quantized loop algebra action that I built from the Y's. So there are really two actions. I have an action of quantized loop algebras, and I have an action of the center. And these two commute. So that's really the setting that I want to do. And let's go back to these two examples that I have. So here is the one where I first assigned the Y's eigenvalues, and then I introduced the t's as forced by the affine Hecke algebra relations. So this will be sent, well, to this tensor product over the Hecke algebra with w. And now I can kind of separate the factors, and I can really think of this as r copies of cr, where each of the r crs has parameters, uh, let's say, zj and zj inverse. And this is really the tensor product of evaluation modules. Here, the L operator is precisely what you know before. And this is very interesting because we know its trace is the transfer matrix of the inhomogeneous XXZ spin chain. And if R was two, then this, this is the transfer matrix of the six vertex model for general R, its corresponding higher rank models. But in this case, the center of the affine Hecke algebra just acts by scalars because it's symmetric polynomials in these parameters Z that were just complex numbers. So the center here is not very interesting. Now in the second example that I had where I do polynomials and I act on them by these, uh, well, these demonosuralistic operators and each stratnic difference operators. And now let's first take the special case where R is one. So remember that this W was the n-fold tensor product of CR. If R is one, then this W is just one dimensional. So this is really the trivial module of the finite Hecke algebra. So really I could have write it in my old notation like this. And this tensor product just projects polynomials to be completely symmetric polynomials. In this case, the L operator is boring, so there is no quantized loop algebra, but the, the center is very interesting. So now we have symmetric functions in these difference operators. So let me choose the basis of elementary symmetric polynomials and the element, the case elementary symmetric polynomial in the, actually the inverse of the Y's gives me precisely the case McDonald operator. So for instance, here is the first McDonald operator. It can be written as a sum with some rational coefficients times this difference operators. Unfortunately, McDonald uses the notation T for these as well. So these are not heck operators, but these are the, so T Q X J is the operator that sends X J to Q times X J. Where Q was this parameter that enter, entered through the, this kind of cyclic twist uh, here. And more precisely, if you think about the so here, where the finite dimensional irreducibles for the Hecke algebra module, they are sent in this case precisely to, well, the appropriate Hecke symmetrizations, which are precisely each non-symmetric McDonald polynomial is sent to maybe a multiple of the corresponding symmetric McDonald polynomial. So basically, this is how the McDonald theory fits into this framework as a sort of a very degenerate case where the rank was one. But in this case, the quantum group action was interesting, and here the center was boring. Here the, cent the quantum group was boring, but the center was very interesting. So now, of course, we want to go to a setting in which both are interesting. So let me, in this case, call W tilde this same tensor product of taking the Hecke algebra module of polynomials 
uh, on which we act as usual with the t's and by the q by the stereotonic difference operators uh, for the y's and we really take a tensor product with c r and full tensor products where r is uh, at least two so in this case i can again think of this as polynomial so n copies of CR, each with a variable. And now I symmetrize. So another way to understand this tensor product over the Hecke algebra, in this case, is it can be formulated as being the space of all the vectors in this n-fold tensor product that are invariant under the following action of the symmetric group. It is just the permutation coordinates following our check of xi over xi plus 1. So if you're familiar with the QKZ story, for Razumov Stroganov conjecture, this is precisely the same thing. This is called the exchange relation because I want invariance under this. So I want this thing to act by the identity. So if R check itself acts by a permutation, you may have seen that condition before. It's nothing but this tensor product over the Hecke algebra in this case. If T goes to one, then this slightly complicated thing just becomes permuting the X's and permuting the spin factors. In other words, I'm saying that you're invariant under simultaneously permuting both the coordinates and the spins. So if I permute these two particles, both the coordinates and the spins, then I not, want nothing to happen. So physically, these would be called bosons, and I can call these T deformed bosons, if you wish. Now, this space from the quantum sure wild duality setting comes with non-abelian symmetries, namely the action of this quantum loop algebra with the L operator involving these quantized inhomogeneities where we replace the parameter Z by Ys. And moreover, it comes with Amelian uh, symmetries. So in this case, there is also a family of spin McDonald operators, namely Laurent polynomials in the Ys. If you take, for instance, the elementary symmetric polynomials again, they form what I now want to call spin McDonald operators. And before I showed you the first McDonald operator, here's the first spin McDonald operator. So the structure is like before. I have a sum over all j, the same rational coefficients, and then rather than just having these um, multiplication by Q operators. Here I use R check matrices to move the J particle all the way to the left. Then I do this Q difference, this, this Q um, thing, and then I move it back. In this case, R is one. This R matrix is just the uh, identity and you get back the, the old McDonald operators. But here is the general expression. Here I wrote it down a little bit more explicitly. So for J is one, there are no R matrices. For J is two, you have one R check, which moves particle two to particle two side one. So kind of this little transposition. Then I have this thing in the usual McDonald operator, and then I use an R matrix to transport the particle back. And here the same happens, but now with two R check matrices because the particle is at the second side. And then I use this blob thing, which is this guy and so on. And if you take the right limit, then this will become what is called the spin Calogero Sutherland Hamiltonian, um, which is just the usual Calogero Sutherland Hamiltonian, but with these permutations here. So it acts on the spins. All right. So this is the spin version of the McDonald's model. So still no spin chain yet. Um, so let me maybe, uh, in view of time, um, let me maybe skip this. I'm happy to talk about it afterwards if people are interested. So I can discuss. What the highest weight eigenvectors of this spin McDonald operator look like. Now, what I want to do instead is here I've repeated this spin McDonald setting. So I have this space which comes with an L operator and an action of the center by spin McDonald operators. Then I want to extract a spin chain. So what I mean by a spin chain is it is something that's certainly allowed to act on this factor, but I want to act basically, I, I don't want to allow. Uh, much of a non-trivial action on the polynomial factor. Because for me, certainly these operators that multiplied uh, the variables by Q, the difference operators, that's not good for a spin chain. You're not allowed to act non-trivially on polynomials. So I want to get rid of these difference operators. So this is going to go in two steps. The first step is what you might call a semi-classical limit, which will get us from difference operators to differential operators. So the idea is that Note that these difference operators here, they expand in terms of Q, this parameter in the in the Cherednik Y operators, as the identity, and then there's a derivative in line, at linear order. So I could basically, if I want to get rid of the difference operators, I could try setting Q to one. 
But if I set Q to one, then this difference operator really becomes one. So you just erase the dot here. You use the unitarity condition to just pull straight all these lines and you get the identity. But it's not so good. So if you take the spin McDonald operator at Q is one, you get rid of all the R matrices and actually it's known that this is just a constant. So this is not a good operator. So instead what we're going to do is we're going to linearize around Q is one. So take the derivative with respect to Q at Q is one. So let me denote this by delta. Then the delta of the first spin McDonald operator has the following form. So let's think about this expression for a moment. These difference operators here, for instance, I can move it to the right. This will affect, will put a, Q, a factor of Q in this R matrix. If I move this to the right, then it will put a Q in this R matrix and in this R matrix, and then it will sit to the right. If I linearize this in Q, I will produce three terms in this case. Two terms correspond to taking a derivative of either of these R matrices, and the other one corresponds to taking a derivative of the T that is now to the right. So I've grouped together all the derivatives of just the difference operators when moved all to the right. So then I get these derivatives. In this case, the arguments of the R matrices are unaffected. So again, I have effectively erased this blob here. I can undo all these crossings and I just get uh, a derivative with the rational function as a coefficient. Or for each J, I get a sum over all the R matrices that were to the right of it in the picture, all these R matrices. And I take the derivative with respect to Q. And then if you do a little bit of algebra, it's easy to see that this produces a rational coefficient times precisely this picture where this dash, this weekly line means the derivative of the R matrix at the, at the uh, at argument one. Right? So now we have the sum over all the I less than J because basically what's happened is at some point, I'm going to take the derivative, for instance, of this R matrix. Then um, this part here, I can just unwind. So I get straight lines here. Then here I get the derivative of the R matrix. And then you use R matrices for transport otherwise. So that's precisely where this picture comes from. It's just a linearization of this thing here. Now this operator, if you think about it a little bit more carefully, you can check that these linearized McDonald operators have non-abelian symmetries. So I can just take the L operator at Q is one, unlike the McDonald operators this thing is already non-trivial because the Y operators, unlike the McDonald operators, are not trivial at Q is one. And moreover, this model has abelian symmetries. So these different linearized McDonald operators, they all commute with each other. And the reason to understand this is you expand the commutator, you use these symmetries that you had before sending Q to one, and you use that the zeroth order is a constant. This will show that all these commutators are still, uh, we still have all these symmetries. So this is kind of a little bit good. We're not quite at a spin chain yet, but we have at least got rid of difference operators. And now we're going to have, and we have these differential operators. So now the second part is we have to remove these derivatives. And so basically I want to get rid of this part of the spin McDonald operator. And the observation is, let's look at this a little bit more carefully. This thing is actually something, one of the, very close to one of the other linearized McDonald operators. Namely, if I look at the last McDonald operator, it's actually independent of R matrices. So it's the same as the usual last McDonald operator without spins, which is just a product of all these Q shifts. And if I linearize that, I get just a sum of derivatives. So compare again to this. This is also a sum of derivatives, but it has these rational coefficients. So what we're going to ask is, is it possible to find the point for which all these coefficients become independent of J, just some constants? And the answer is yes. If I choose Z, to be precisely primitive root of unity, second uh, root of unity, and so on. So precisely the points equally spaced on the unit circle. Then all these A's are constant independently of J. So at that special point, I can basically take this linearized McDonald operator and subtract a suitable constant of the linearized last McDonald operator. This will get rid precisely of this stuff here. So I'm left with this operator here, but now I have to replace all the x's with z's. So that's what I'm doing. I'm replacing all the x's with z's, and then I'm also getting rid of this prefactor, which I don't really care about. And this is how I derive this Hamiltonian that I showed in the start. So now you can understand its structure as coming from linearized McDonald operators at these special points, so that I could also got rid of the um, derivatives.
end. So here's the conclusion. This operator that I had before, which now, if you're really formal, you can understand is not really acting on this, but you take polynomials in Xs, tensor products with the C to the R over the Heck algebra. But now, actually, rather than thinking about evaluating these Zjs to root of unities, which is actually, so this is a little technical point, but I think it's nice. This condition here is not so good because this tensor product over the Hecke algebra is really something that's kind of, for instance, if R is one, it's projected onto symmetric functions. But here I really kind of evaluate that very non-symmetric ways that Xi is going to become Z1. Sorry, X1 is Z1, X2 is Z2 and so on. And these have very different values. So instead what I can do is I note that the power sums they basically all vanish. If you add powers of roots of unities, you almost always get zero unless you add the nth powers of the nth root of unities, in which case you get n. So really what I'm doing is I'm actually taking a quotient by the ideal of all the power sums and um, the, power, the nth power sum minus n. So this is kind of an algebraically more clean way of setting the x's to be roots of unities. I'm really working mod load is ideal. This is preserved by the Hecke algebra action. So I can take this tensor product. And actually, if you do a dimension count, you see that this is precisely uh, the same dimension as CR and full tensor product. So now I'm very happy to interpret this as a spin chain operator just on this space here. It has all these abelian symmetries, which come from linearized McDonald operators, um, where you subtract the suitable multiple of the last linearized McDonald operator at these special values or modulo this ideal. They're all commuting operators with each other, which are obtained from the center. And it has these non-abelian symmetries, um, which come from the L operator with these Ys instead of inhomogeneities at Q is one, and then modulo this ideal. So it's a little bit of a sort of a complicated L operator, but it's something that is explicit enough that you can put it in Mathematica, for instance, and you can really check that this operator does really commute with all these things coming from the L operator. So now there's the last part, which I really, uh, I skipped before. So I, I should probably also skip this here, but the point is that maybe at least now it's not so surprising. So, that I, um, so let me break, this is the say, if you ignore all the gray stuff, then this here is the statement that I had before. Uh, so just the black text. So go to the, just the rank two case. So quantum loop GL2. Then I have exact quantum loop GL2 highest weight factors, which are determined by this component, which has some spins, all the down spins sitting to the left and all the up spins sitting to the right. This determined by comes from the fact that we act on this tensor product over the Hecke algebra. So somehow, if you think about it hard enough, then you see that this space here has a basis that is completely determined by each vector in here. Um, so if I fix M down spins, then each vector in here is completely determined by any single component. And this one is particularly simple if I put all the down spins to the left and all the up spins to the right. And maybe now at least it's not so surprising since we've derived this Hamiltonian as coming from a setting with McDonald's operators that its eigenfunctions feature McDonald's polynomials. What is, however, the kind of the striking effect, and it's really a kind of a, some extra time uh, if I would explain it, is that here you have a McDonald's polynomial at this special point where Q has somehow become T and T has become T squared. So here in this derivation, I said Q is one almost. I linearize around Q is one. So somehow what happens is I don't get McDonald's polynomials at Q is one, but I get McDonald's polynomials at this particular uh, tuple of parameters QT that correspond to this quantum spherical zonal point. And uh, just for the people who like quantized loop algebras, Here's a very explicit way to write the Driffeld polynomial in terms of the partition of the leading power if I take into account this van der Monde squared prefactor. And you can ex very explicitly write down the eigenvalues. So we have an extremely explicit uh, understanding of the spectrum of this Hamiltonian. Actually, its eigenvalues and its Driffeld, well, we, we understand this for higher rank as well. Um, we can also say some things about the, the form of these exact eigenvectors for higher ranks, but they're a little bit more complicated. Um, so maybe let me just finish. So I hope that I've at least convinced you that this quantum sure wild duality is a very nice way. So we start from this affine Hecke algebra, take 
use quantum affine sure, this, this uh, sure functor uh, for the representation of polynomials to kind of produce something acting on symmetric polynomials, and you get this McDonald's story. If similarly, you take the sure functor for polynomials, but now you really introduce some non-trivial spin dependence. So this was for R is one. This is for general R. Then we got this spin McDonald setting, which already had abelian symmetries coming from the center by spin McDonald operators. It has non-abelian symmetries, which is this L operator with Ys instead of inhomogeneities. And it has exact eigenvectors for, um, which I haven't said yet, but it basically follows from the non-symmetric McDonald theory. Basically, these exact eigenvectors in the spin McDonald model are obtained by suitable partial symmetrizations of non-symmetric McDonald polynomials. So I think of this as a mo model of particles moving around with spins. And then I can take this very special limit, which corresponds to an expansion in Q or a semi-classical limit, which leads the particles to sit at their classical equilibrium values, which are precisely these nicely equally spaced points. And then I produce a spin chain, which we now understand must have these abelian symmetries, the non-abelian symmetries, and I briefly mentioned the exact eigenvectors. And actually, these exact eigenvectors make a connection to a spinless model um, with less particles. That's why it's only in M variables, this polynomial that I showed you at the end. And to really finish, I would like to put this in a slightly bigger perspective. So this is kind of the landscape of long-range spin chains that I'm really interested in. So I've basically talked about this T-deformed haldane shastri model and in the start, the ordinary haldane shastri model. Something that you're more familiar with are all these Heisenberg spin chains. So this is the one that corresponds to, uh, let's say, the six vertex model transfer matrix. Here I'm just looking at uh, rank two case. It has a, a GL2 invariant limit, which is T going to one, which is just the Heisenberg XXX spin chain. But it also has a more complicated version, which is the XYZ spin chain, which has different interactions in all directions, is related to the eight vertex model instead. So you might wonder, is there, for instance, an XYZ-like version of the haldane shastri model? This is not known yet, but I think algebraically we have a lot of the structure that might be required to do this in place to actually get there. And then something that I haven't talked about at all is that there's actually some long-range spin chain that interpolates between the Heisenberg and the haldane shastri spin chain. At the moment, I don't really understand how to put it in the sure while duality context, but at least you can write down it's Hamiltonian and it has complicated but exact uh, kind of, you use a version of the beta ansatz now involving elliptic functions. It makes a connection to the elliptic color zero model and it produces exact eigenvectors for this model that interpolate between the exact eigenvectors of Heisenberg and Haldane Shastri. So this one is algebraically much more complicated and less well understood, but it's very cool. It's also an exactly solved model. And the big picture in which I would like to put all these things is maybe we can do something like I explained with freezing. So this is what I talked about today, how to get from here this spin chain. You can do the same for Calogero Sutherland to get Haldane Shastri. There is an exalyptic Heisenberg model. So I kind of hope that this will give a way to produce this kind of T deformed Inozemtsev spin chain that should interpolate between XXZ and the spin chain that I've been talking about today. And very ambitiously, you might study, which is a very uh, kind of uh, quite an active topic at the moment a double elliptic system, which is elliptic both in the coordinates and in the derivatives. So these are rational, uh, th these are diff uh, the, um, differential operators. These are difference operators, which you can think of as being trigonometric in the differentials, right? It depends on sort of Q to the differential. So it's something that is uh, essentially has one period in the derivatives. So here you can likewise do something that is elliptic, so doubly periodic in the derivatives as well as the positions. This model is currently studied. So people have proposed a Hamiltonian. People, other people have proposed some eigenfunctions. It's not quite clear if those eigenfunctions are precisely eigenfunctions of the other Hamiltonian. But anyway, th this is being investigated at the moment. And of course, if you would be able to understand this model here properly and do this whole thing of freezing, it would produce a spin chain sitting up here, which in limits would give rise to this whole landscape of long range spin chains that are all exactly solvable in some sense. So that's really the context that I'm interested in. But I hope that I've at least shown you a little bit of quite beautiful representation theory and how it produces both things that you knew and things that you may never have heard of before. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Let's thank the speaker.